but you will know. And that's why even on the Apple II, he wants a circuit board to be beautiful. And when they get to the Macintosh, the next one over, even though you cannot open it, he holds it up for a while because the chips on the circuit board are not neatly aligned. And when they say, but nobody can open it, nobody will know, he says to the Mac designers, but you will know. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, you know, talking about you know, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, and those two things, is Steve Jobs had the passion of an artist to have end-to-end -end control. Hardware, integrate it with software, don't open it up. Woz's view was much more open, that we could license out the software, but on the Apple II, I think it had eight slots. You know, you could jack into it, you could put stuff into it, you could open it up, you could get to the circuit board. And Steve was against, Steve Jobs was against having slots. He wanted, as an artist would, you know, he wouldn't want Bob Dylan saying, let's have an open source on my lyrics, you know, everybody can put the words they want. He didn't like people jacking and opening up. Waz kind of insists that he wants the Apple II to have these jacks, the slots, but the Macintosh doesn't. And the Macintosh doesn't even have screws that you can use to open it up. And that was very Steve Jobs-like. All the way through his career, really believing and tightly controlling like the gardens of Kyoto that he loved to visit. Carefully curated, carefully walled, carefully tended by one artist's sensibility. So let's move now to the Macintosh era. <clears throat> so much is going on at Apple at that point. There's so much growth. Uh, and his personal courtship of John Scully begins. Can you talk a little bit about that, that on it again, a, off again relationship? It was a bad mistake. Uh, I mean, it was almost like uh, he saw John Scully a bit as a father figure or a mentor. Scully really wanted to be cool and hip and wanted Steve's approval, and it was for a while, you know, the famous line, I think it's at the uh, San Remo apartment that Steve is thinking of buying, and he brings John Scully up in New York, they're looking over Central Park, and Scully's demurring, and Steve says, do you want to spend the rest of your life, because Scully was at Pepsi, you know, selling sugar water, or do you want to change the world? And so Scully comes, and Scully is a man of prep school sensibilities, great manners, very kind, but he's hard, it's hard for him to deal with conflict. Steve felt the price, I mean, I'd say, why were you so tough? He said, well, the price of admission to being with me is that I gotta be able to tell you you're full of it. Actually, use the word with two more letters than yep. it. Yep. Um, and you gotta be able to tell me I'm full of it and we're gonna really duke it out. And Scully was not that way. Secondly, Scully was basically a marketer. You know, and having run Pepsi US, he didn't sit there worrying about the product. He was not fiddling with the formula for Doritos and saying, I can make this insanely great, this Dorito. It was shelf space marketing. And I think Steve, after a while, felt that Scully just didn't get into how awesome the Mac was. And then it didn't help that the Mac, even though it was insanely great, Scully priced it at almost 2,500 bucks. It did not sell very well. Microsoft started licensing out its copied version of the graphical user interface and started dominating the computer business. And so I think their relationship was doing fine as long as Apple was doing fine. And the Apple II was a workhorse. It was making the money for the company. But the Mac didn't, and so there was a horrible falling out that culminates on Memorial Day of 1985. Before we talk a little bit more about the falling out in the post-85 period, let's talk about the invention of the Macintosh itself, the design itself. And this is a point in the book where you insert uh, the great, famous quote from, uh, from Jobs, good artists copy, great artists steal, which he took from Picasso. And then he would add, and we have always been shameless about stealing great ideas. That quote is often associated with the genesis of the Macintosh because of Xerox Park and the yeah. graphical interface. So, what? so they take two visits to, visit to Xerox Park. And as you know, Xerox had come up 
with the concept of the desktop metaphor, the graphical interface. More importantly, sort of a bitmap design, meaning each pixel on that screen could be mapped to you know, bits in the microprocessor. Um, and so you could make a beautiful machine. You and I are old enough to remember, and certainly if you're not, you can go into this museum here, to remember when you have to do you know, those green fossil letters, you know, C prompts with C colon backslash whatever command. You know, it was god awful. And suddenly, at Time Magazine, we get the Mac, and you can click, and the document appear. You know, you can drag and drop. Well, but let, so I do a whole big section on both the visits to Xerox Park, and I think the misconception that they just took the graphical interface from Xerox Park because it takes two years of the most amazing designers, including Andy and others on the team, to take what it, the metaphor that Xerox used and to really make it great. You have to remember, Xerox came out with the Star two years before the Mac came out. I think it sold like seven copies in all of America. I mean, it was a kludgy, bad machine. What they did when they took that metaphor was say, oh, we'll take the mouse with three buttons and totally simplify it. And you'll be able to click and drag and drop and double click and open things up. We'll invent pull-down menus. And Bill Atkinson invents you know, clipping, where you can have documents sort of looking like they're on top of other documents, so it looks like a messy desktop. We can do things. So none of that was in the Xerox original graphical interface. So I think, uh, first of all, they take the Xerox metaphor and actually make it insanely great. Secondly, uh, T.S. Eliot's line, you know, there falls the shadow between the conception and the reality. Well, they were able to execute on it, which Xerox and others warned. But it is true that part of Steve's genius was looking at a thousand ideas at any given point and saying that one's great, that, and this one sucks, and this we're going to ignore, but uh, pulling together ideas, including ideas from Xerox Park. And this is one of the times where he's pushing this team incredibly hard. I mean, it Reality seems to distortion me field is then coined by. I mean, at, at one that point, point. Um, one of the engineers, I think Larry Kenyon is his name, is in charge of the boot up of the machine. And Steve says, it's taken too long to boot up. You've got to shave 10 seconds off the boot up time. Reality distortion field. The guy says, you can't. It's actually a really elegant piece of code. It can't, I can't shave 10. And Steve says, if you could save a human life, would you shave 10 seconds off? And Kenyon goes, well, yeah. <laughs> so Steve goes to a piece of whiteboard or whatever and says, all right, say there are a million Macintoshes. And say it's 10 seconds every time somebody boots up. And in a given year, it's done this number of times. And he multiplies it out and says, you can save this number of lives every year if you shave off 10 seconds. An example of the reality distortion field working? Within four weeks, Larry Kenyon has shaved off 28 seconds. Everything about that, you know, you see the screen? It's a rounded rectangle. Um, I think it's Bill Atkinson. I'll get corrected if I get some of the names wrong, but I think it's Atkinson, or, uh, who's doing what's called the primitives that you can easily put on the screen. So he does a square, which is easy, and a rectangle. And then he does a circle, which is hard because the microprocessor doesn't do square roots, but he figures out a way to do a circle. And Steve says, yeah, but you need not only a rectangle and a circle, but a rectangle with rounded edges. The guy says, well, no, that can't be done, and why do we need it? And Steve makes him walk around the parking lot in the neighborhood, pointing to things like windshields and billboards and you know, don't, no parking signs and screens of computers saying rounded rectangles are what people see every day. They're more beautiful to look at. Atkinson or came up with the a primitive to yeah. do a rounded rack. And even, you know, those thin pinstripes on the pull-down menus, Steve fretted over them. Even the um, Susan Kerr doing the fonts. I mean, you know, Steve was there because he had taken that calligraphy course when he dropped out of Reed, caring about the spacing on each one of those fonts. The, um, the perfection that he was seeking at that point and the, the, the almost impossible tasks he was, he was asking people to perform uh, engendered in the book, as you report it, two, two completely different camps, it seems to me, 
it, of people who worked for jobs at that point. There were the people who, like Bud Tribble, who says he'd push you, you'd be better for it. Right. And then, Bud was one of the great engineers on the team. And then there are others who say, worst experience of my life. Uh, if, you, if you balance, not only in this case, but in other cases too, the number of people you encountered who felt one way, tremendous affection, and the number of people who felt another way, what, would, would you say that there's a... Well, there are actually three categories, because a lot of people felt both. Yeah, you know, yeah. That it was a really agonizing experience and the best experience. But especially with the Macintosh team, or even with the team today, the overwhelming uh, number say, he pushed me to do things I never thought I could do. He drove me nuts at times. It was the greatest experience in my life. So it premieres. It's a great commercial, you know, the legendary commercial. Talk a little bit about the, his view of the creation of, that, of the 1984 commercial. Well, the 1984 ad is interesting because in Steve Jobs' soul, you do have the heart or soul of a member of the counterculture, a rebel, a misfit. In fact, even the Think Different ads start with, here's to the rebels, the misfits, uh, those who think different. The 1984 ad is, I think, an incredible in cultural landmark and icon. Obviously, because of the Orwell novel, we had been thinking up until then of computers as being centralized.